Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start with a couple of questions uh, around your transportation habits. So how many of you use Uber and Lyft on a regular basis? All right, almost everyone. How many of you own a car? All right, quite a few. Of those of you who own a car, how many own a connected car? A car that has a direct connection to the internet? All right, so even fewer. How many of you use Wi-Fi when they are on Uber and Lyft? So that just shows you how tiny the fraction of vehicles is that is actually connected to the internet. And that was our starting point at Venium. Uh, and we quickly realized that while everyone is talking about how billions of things are getting connected to the internet, very few people are actually realizing that many of these things are going to be moving. And for us, it all starts with vehicles. So let me show you our vision of a city where all the vehicles are connected, not only to the internet, but also to each other. So this is Porto, Portugal, where I grew up. Uh, and uh, once every car, bus, and truck is connected, we can view vehicles not just as machines that carry people and goods from point A to point B, but actually as active nodes in the internet. This is Robin Chase, my, the founder of Zipcar and our co-founder. And this is actually a network that already exists and works in Porto. Every single bus is a Wi-Fi hotspot serving Wi-Fi to more than 350,000 users, and it connects to other buses and also taxis and garbage collection trucks, forming a mesh network that covers the city and does three main things. One, it expands wireless coverage for all those people. Two, it's able to send a lot of data from the vehicles to the cloud to improve all sorts of fleet management and maintenance activities. And third, we use the vehicles as mobile sensors to gather data uh, from the physical infrastructure to the cloud to power all sorts of different smart city applications. So why do we want every single vehicle to be connected? Well, some of the, our favorite reasons are maybe not the first ones that you would think. Now, for one, vehicles are ideal hotspots because they're everywhere. Uh, they have very large batteries that keep recharging, so they're energy independent. Uh, and uh, in the US, in Europe, and in other places around the world, they actually have a frequency band around 5.9 gigahertz uh, that only transportation systems can use. This is 75 megahertz of spectrum that is reserved for vehicles uh, and that does not interfere with the usual Wi-Fi spectrum. We also see vehicles as the ideal mobile sensors gathering terabytes of data, uh, because once every vehicle is a Wi-Fi hotspot, it can actually connect to any data gathering device, be it a camera, be it an uh, uh, environmental sensor, uh, or any other uh, device that is able to gather data, and the vehicle then decides when to send this data to the cloud. We also see these active nodes uh, as the ideal hubs for IoT, uh, and the vehicles in Porto are already connecting, for example, to little sensors that are in garbage cans, and they are reading whether the garbage cans are full or not, so that garbage collection trucks only need to go to those containers that are actually full. We also see mesh-connected vehicles as the ideal infrastructure for emergency situations. Why? Because even if the power grid falls down, as long as you have a large enough density of vehicles that have their batteries, you actually can operate a wireless network uh, even for several hours after uh, everything collapses, and this can save a lot of lives. And finally, the only application that uh, actually the U.S. Department of Transportation has pursued very, very actively is the use of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication and vehicle-to-infrastructure communication to avoid vehicles from crashing into each other, to disseminate uh, alarms uh, in case of accidents, uh, and basically save lives uh, on the road. Now, this is exactly what we're doing today. We already have 
uh, in the market a full stack solution that includes all the hardware, the software, and the cloud components that are required to build networks of connected vehicles and offer managed services from the cloud. What kind of managed services? On the one hand, fully managed mobile Wi-Fi hotspots uh, so that you can actually enjoy Wi-Fi, have all sorts of different content and advertising directly from the cloud. Uh, then basically gathering the, all the data from the vehicle and bringing it to the cloud, as I mentioned before. Uh, and finally, also uh, using the vehicles to gather urban data. We also realized actually that uh, our technology is able to solve uh, an important problem in a number of industries that have to operate in harsh environments, uh, like uh, container terminals, airports, construction sites, where you have large metallic structure that make wireless propagation really hard. Uh, and by having a mesh network of vehicles, you're actually able to overcome the dead zones uh, in this type of environments. Now, how does this work? Well, there's a little device uh, which we called uh, the NetRider, uh, which actually is a small computer uh, with processing power and storage uh, that is uh, able to communicate with many different types of networks. So it has a 4G LTE um, interface to be able to use cellular as a failback. Uh, it has Wi-Fi to be able to connect to your smartphone and all sorts of different Wi-Fi enabled devices. Uh, and finally, uh, it also has DSRC or IEEE 802.11p interfaces to be able to connect to other vehicles in the 5.9 gigahertz span. And so once you have these devices, uh, the vehicle actually becomes, you know, a, a node that can leverage all these heterogeneous networks that are available to offer Wi-Fi, as I mentioned, digital advertising, urban data acquisition, uh, ticketing and charging, uh, be able to connect to uh, onboard cameras, uh, and be a data carrier for other devices, and basically gather what we call high-definition data. What do we mean by that? When you look at today at the... Uh, products that are available for connected vehicles, uh, they all have three main problems. Uh, so one is that they are single purpose, so you need a little gadget to track the vehicle, a little gadget to connect to the onboard diagnostics, a little gadget uh, for tolling. Uh, so all of these uh, uh, little gadgets uh, become a hassle for fleet managers to be able to deal with. The second aspect is they only use the cellular network. And because cellular traffic is so expensive, they try to minimize as much as possible the number of bits that go from the vehicle to the cloud. And of course, this limits immensely the analytics that you can do and the value that you can deliver to the end customer. And finally, the third pro problem is that they don't evolve. If I want new functionalities, I have to rip and replace all the gadgets that I have. And so the Venium solution solves these three problems by being multi-purpose, multi-network, and by evolving through software updates. And so we're able to connect to the onboard diagnostics, we have GPS, we're also able to uh, basically gather data from uh, all the different systems in the, in, in the vehicle. Uh, and we use not just the cellular network, but also Wi-Fi and the vehicular network to actually offload traffic. And in Porto, 70% of the traffic uh, in downtown is going through the Wi-Fi network, and only 30% is going through 4G uh, LTE. And finally, we run uh, software updates uh, routinely uh, in, in Porto. I think last year we had 38 software updates in one year. So. Let me walk you through an example here in New York. You all know Link NYC. Who does not know Link NYC? So everyone knows the kiosks that are uh, uh, starting to pop up everywhere. Uh, and they're basically providing um, Wi-Fi uh, to people. And the typical range, uh, you know, it's going to be uh, 50 to 80 uh, meters, and basically so 100, 150 feet. And we're able to... Uh, access them very easily with our smartphone. But if a vehicle starts to connect, it takes a few seconds, and by the time you're finally able to send data, the vehicle is already outside of the range of Wi-Fi. In, during rush hour, you may be a little bit luckier, and you're actually able to upload a lot of data. <laughs> but in most cases, this won't work. Now, in the 5.9 gigahertz band that I mentioned before, which in the US and in Europe is reserved for vehicles, you can actually get up to 10 times the range of regular Wi-Fi. Uh, in the 5.9 gigahertz band. And so now, uh, you're actually able to get a lot more coverage, even if only a fraction of the access points has this additional wireless interface. And so when a vehicle connects to the access point using this technology, you can then 
use this vehicle as an access point for other vehicles. And so now this vehicle is also an access point for other vehicles. I have to go closer to the computer, let's see. And so the second vehicle connects to the first vehicle, and now each of them is also a Wi-Fi hotspot in the usual 2.4 gigahertz band. And so by adding more and more vehicles, you're actually able to expand the wireless coverage from the existing Wi-Fi infrastructure uh, all over the city. And so this allows us to actually get 10 times longer range than classical Wi-Fi. Uh, the connection setup is in four milliseconds. We can do handovers in less than 20 milliseconds. And we're actually able to do that across all these different technologies. And overall, even as you roll out the um, hardware, uh, it actually gets uh, to be uh, at least 12 times cheaper than a cellular only solution. All right. So let's look under the hood. Uh, my colleagues and I have been working on uh, connected vehicles, uh, first in the university and then the company for uh, about 11 years now. Uh, and actually, I'll, I'd love to share a little bit of the story, because uh, as a professor, I was always very, very intrigued, basically, by how much data could I actually take from the physical world to the internet. At the time, people were talking about smart dust, which was basically just spreading all sorts of wireless sensors, and they would self-organize. And I was always very frustrated by the fact that if I place a sensor in a certain location, I only get data from that location and nowhere else. And so I thought, well, these sensors have to be mobile. Uh, and so how would we do this in the city? And then one of my colleagues said, well, I'm working with taxis. Have you thought of taxis? So we then thought, OK, let's use the taxis to gather data, environmental data, infrastructure data, and so on. But then we quickly bumped into the next problem, which was cellular was way too expensive. There was no way that on a university budget we would be able to upload terabytes of data from sensor data from the city. And around that time, this was 2007, 2008, uh, one of the cable operators in, in Porto was actually the, the, an early adapter of Font solution, uh, who were the first to turn people's home Wi-Fi routers into public Wi-Fi hotspots that everyone could use. And so, uh, from one day to the other, Porto suddenly had 40,000 Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, and, uh, uh, and we thought, well, we should be able to use them. And so we started running some tests, uh, and started seeing that, yes, it's possible to send data, but there are very strong limitations uh, on, with, with regular Wi-Fi. And then we saw that IEEE was publishing this new standard for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. And at the time, I bought from NEC uh, some uh, prototype boxes, which were tremendously expensive. We bought five of them, and we were among the first to publish papers that actually uh, were experimenting with uh, vehicles communicating at the 5.9 gigahertz band. Uh, we published a paper in particular where we show that vehicles are obstacles to wireless propagation themselves because they're metal boxes and everyone was just ignoring them. Uh, and so all the studies were actually way too optimistic and we were able to show that. But at some point, we started realizing what would be really, really nice would be to build a mesh network of vehicles to be able to, to do that. Um, and so in 2011, I gave a talk at uh, MIT and, uh, and the lady who was in the uh, uh, audience came to me and said, a professor that's really interesting and exciting. Uh, I'm, I, I uh, am, am an investor as well, and there are two things that uh, you should do. One is you should start a company, and two, you should talk with Robin Chase. And I had no idea who Robin was, but then I looked her up and I saw Zipcar, of course, uh, I knew Zipcar, and then I saw a TED talk where in 2007, Robin said that every vehicle should be a Wi-Fi hotspot. I said, wow, that's exactly what we're doing in Porto. And, and uh, after exchanging some emails, and uh, uh, she sent me to her uh, CTO and husband, Roy Russell, who's uh, now our CTO at, at, at Venium. Uh, and he uh, sent me back to Robin, and we met for the first time actually in Silicon Valley, which is strange because I, I'm from Portugal and Robin is from Boston. But we met in Palo Alto, so it's a Silicon Valley story, I'm sorry to say. Anyways, uh, uh, after two hours, we decided to start the company. And basically, today, uh, we have uh, now uh, in Porto our de uh, a city scale de deployment. We're deploying also in, in Singapore, and we'll soon announce also our first city uh, here in the United States. So, what are the what were the technology challenges in actually coming up with a solution that worked? Well, for one, you needed the hardware. You needed onboard units. Uh, and there, our approach was to use off-the-shelf components and combine them in the smart way. And the most difficult piece was that there were not so many vendors for the DSRC uh, chip, or, the, or basically the uh, 5.9 gigahertz band. 
uh, interface. Uh, but we were able to, 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 to do that. Uh, and then obviously we needed to uh, be able to retrofit access points or add access points that were able to also communicate with the vehicles uh, at that uh, frequency. Um, for a while, and also our investors, at, at, uh, early investors at Union Square Ventures, and, and, and uh, not so much true, but very much Union Square, asked us, can, can, can't you just be a software company? Why do you need to be a hardware company? Uh, but we actually realized that it was very important to be able to control the entire stack for many of the things that we wanted to do. For example, we were able to improve GPS positioning uh, by using uh, the parameters of the wireless uh, signals that we're getting. Uh, and unless we were able to get those values from the hardware, we would actually not be able to run the uh, algorithms to be able to do that. Uh, and we encountered over and over with synchronization and other issues where we actually, actually being able to control the hardware was really great for the type of performance that we wanted to achieve. On the other hand, also, uh, even though we know that vehicles are going to come out of the factory in a few years already with all these uh, different interfaces, uh, new vehicles are only 7% of vehicles every year. So 93% are actually vehicles that are already on the road, and so the aftermarket is really uh, where uh, uh, we decided to start uh, because that's how we could scale fastest. And commercial fleets are 26% of total uh, vehicles. And so we're actually able to scale fastest by providing commercial fleets with a value proposition that they needed. Now, on the networking software side, uh, we have the connection control algorithms that decide, do I connect to this vehicle, or did that access point, or do I move back to cellular, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have mobility control, super important because uh, Today, you can enter any bus in Porto, you can start a Skype call or a YouTube video, and even though the bus is switching between all these different uh, um, connections every few seconds, your Skype call and YouTube video never breaks down. And so we're actually able to do handovers across these different technologies. And of course, cell carriers are able to do that from one cell station to the other, but that's in their own network, which they control themselves fully. We're able to do that across different networks that actually are controlled by different people. We have delay tolerant protocols where we cache the data that does not need to be sent immediately and, and, and wait for the cheapest, best connection. Uh, the position of the vehicle needs to be sent immediately, so I, I if in most cases, like for an Uber or Lyft vehicle, uh, but, uh, uh, and, and then I will use cellular if I don't have any other chance, but uh, for example, uh, the full onboard diagnostics, footage from surveillance cameras, driver behavior, that can be stored and sent later. Uh, we have uh, mesh networking and multi-hops I mentioned before, security for all of this, and then being able to control of that from the crowd, run analytics, and be actually able to provide these data streams through APIs so that others can actually build smart city applications on top of that. Now, let me show you our first mesh deployment. So we did this video, which is the day in the life of a vehicular mesh network, which is actually a port. That was our first paying, paying customer. Uh, and so we had the, the big dots are access points, and the little dots are trucks carrying containers. And you can see how they connect. Uh, green are vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle connections, and blue are vehicle-to-infrastructure connections. And you see how they overcome the dead zones. Now they're having lunch, so I always have to <laughs> wait until 1 p.m. And there we go again. And so actually the wireless network just uh, scales depending on the uh, needs. I mentioned Porto very briefly, so uh, uh, more than 4 million internet sessions already served, uh, and 70% of the traffic, as I mentioned, uh, is offloaded from cellular to the fixed network. And this is an example of the type of data that we're able to get. So by knowing you know, when people get uh, uh, their device connects to our device, we know where people are getting in the bus and getting out. We don't track individual users, but we're able to aggregate and show during the day where people are coming from and where they're going. So this is rush morning rush hour. So black is origin and uh, gray is destination. So they're coming to downtown. Uh, and then during the afternoon, this changes again and we're able to see how they're going uh, back home to the other side. And so one other example 
And I actually saw, I just skipped a video very quickly of our cloud platform, but I'll jump in a second. But basically, this was an integration of our onboard device with wearables to actually measure the stress of bus drivers. And so what you're going to see is actually uh, a trip uh, from uh, Northern Porto down south. Uh, and basically, green means that you know, uh, you're relaxed. Red means that uh, something happened and you got really, really nervous. Uh, and so we're able to see the entire trajectory and you're actually able to train the drivers by then, you know, zooming in and asking them, do you remember what happened? You know, and so once you have the entire trajectory, you can go after the uh, red spots and now and you zoom in and, and what happened here, the driver says, well, basically, you know, someone was overtaking me from the right, I had to brake, and you can switch to 3D and you can actually look uh, at the speed, which is the height of the bars, and you can see, yes, indeed, he had to break, and here his heart rate was 109, and he was at 81.5 kilometers per hour, and here it was ah, only 88, and, uh, uh, but almost 100 kilometers per hour, so he was actually speeding, but that uh, did not uh, you know, make him nervous. Okay. Now the key is that once you have from many, many different drivers all of this data, you can actually make a map of the danger zones in the city. And you can make recommendations, maybe put a sign, maybe change the direction and reduce uh, the uh, probability of fatalities uh, uh, over there for that. And so these are a few of the uh, examples of, of smart city applications. I jumped the cloud thing, let me see if I'm able to find it. But I, ah, here it is, sorry, so I just clicked too fast. But I'll just finish uh, with uh, showing you Venium Live, which is our latest product, which we presented at Mobile World Congress. And this is a view of Porto, uh, where basically you see all the buses where they are. Uh, yellow are the access points, blue the buses. You can see how they're meshing and how they're connecting uh, to these access points and offloading data. Uh, we're actually able to go back in time and see how the network uh, was uh, performing before, where all the vehicles were. So all of this is, is, is basically available uh, from the cloud. And the business model is, is very simple. There's an initial network setup fee, and then uh, it's a monthly fee per vehicle, depending on the type of service that uh, our customers subscribe to. Uh, and so we're able to go back in time, as I mentioned, and see also how the Wi-Fi coverage changes depending on where the vehicles are. Uh, we're then also able to look at all the metrics uh, for the city. Uh, one interesting application is in the bus depot, uh, where basically they actually try to use regular Wi-Fi, but it doesn't really work when you have hundreds of vehicles trying to upload data. Uh, and with the mesh, they're actually not competing with each other for access point, they're actually helping each other because they just send uh, one packet from one place to the other. Um, and so that's a, a popular feature as well. Uh, and uh, for the, the fleet analytics, we're able to show uh, you know, how the fleet is performing in terms of distance traveled, fuel consumption, uh, all of those usual uh, parameters, but with a much, much higher granularity. Uh, and then once you bring all of that together, you're actually able to have a view of traffic conditions in the city, road infrastructure conditions, measure environmental parameters, all of that. Um, and I'll just let it flow and, and let you take a look. Thank you very much for your attention.